Welcome to a review of Magical Kitties Save the Day, a role-playing game the whole family can enjoy. Before we get started, a thank you to Atlas Games for sending us a review copy of the standard edition of this RPG box set. All right, Magical Kitties Save the Day was designed by Matthew J. Hansen and originally published, uh, self-published by him in PDF format by his name, which was a uh, brand Sneak Attack Press. Now, this was back in 2016. Then four years later, in late 2020, the game was picked up by Atlas Games. Now, Atlas kickstarted a new second edition, publishing it both, again, in digital PDF format, but also a print version of the game. Now, this new second edition was also designed by Matthew J. Hansen, but this time other credited designers include Justin Alexander and Michelle Nephew. And there is a list of developers on this that's six or seven big names in the RPG industry. So this, this was a big group effort. It features artwork from Anthony Cordier, Pat, Kat, B, sorry, Kat Bauman, Akradzina, I, I don't even know, Kazetreva, and Jason Thompson. And I apologize. I actually meant to Google those and look for pronunciations. And I totally forgot. I believe it's show. Ekaterina Kazartseva. Kazartseva. There you go. Actually pronouncing all of the, 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 the consonants this time. So I do apologize, but great looking artwork by these people. Uh, one of the things I found out while doing research for this game is almost every picture of a cat in the game is actually a Kickstarter backers cat that was put into the artwork, which I thought was really cool. Now in this Kickstarter, they published both a deluxe and a second uh, standard edition of the second edition of Magical Kitties um, with all the upgrades that are available in the deluxe edition for sale now separately. So they weren't Kickstarter exclusive. So you could get the deluxe or you could get the basic. If you got the basic, you could also shop around and pick up the other stuff. Now the deluxe edition sold out in under two weeks. It did not last. Like once it was published, like once they, once the Kickstarter backers got their copies and they released it to the wild, boom, gone. Now in May, 2021, Atlas launched a second Magic Kitty Save the Day Kickstarter called Magic Kitty Save the Day Level Up. Now, this features three new source books for the game, and it's what they're doing to reprint the deluxe edition of the game. No, only the deluxe edition, the standard edition isn't available through this Kickstarter. Now, that funded in less than an hour and a half, so congratulations, Atlas. Now, while I was really, really hoping to check out the deluxe edition, um, I'm the one that reached out to Atlas. I kind of begged them for it. I did get the non-deluxe box set due to the limited availability of the deluxe one. So that's what we're talking about tonight. Um, I do know what comes in the other set, and I will be making some comparisons, but what I physically own is the standard edition of Magical Kitty Save the Day in print. Uh, this box has a very reasonable price of $24.95. That's the MSRP. You may be able to find it for cheaper, and I don't suggest paying more than that since new printings are coming. Uh, upgrading from that non-deluxe set at retail will run you, give or take, about $20 for the cards, plus an additional $15 for each of these source books you might want from yeah, that Did you happen set. to catch the, the price on the dice? Because there are also deluxe dice. I did not. Okay, so there are a set of dice. Now, I got to admit, the dice are D6s with kitty paws instead of pips. So you really don't need them, but come on, that's so cute. So Magical Kitty Save the Day is a family-friendly role-playing game where you play magical cats. Every magical kitty has a human and every human has a problem. It's up to your kitty crew to solve these problems while keeping the fact your magic to a secret so the humans can't find out. The game features a pretty simple D6 dice pool system. And this is a traditional RPG with a GM player relationship you'd expect, but it does have many modern RPG and narrative game elements added. So uh, the dice... And oh, uh, sorry, the dice or the wooden kitty paw treats mm. will set you back nine ninety five of each. So ninety five yeah. for the dice, nine ninety five for the magical kitty paw treats in wood. Now, to get a look at what you get in this RPG box set, be sure to check out our Magical Kitties <laughs> Save the Day unboxing video on YouTube. Now you can check that out to see most of it. So I'll just summarize a few things. Overall, I was impressed. Like even with the standard edition, uh, you get two soft cover books in a nice square format, a digest sized comic book that's actually a solo play adventure. There's a fold out pass uh, poster map. There are a nice set of dice, nice pale blue. They're like, I don't know, a cute friendly color. Like they're, they're welcoming color. And you get a ridiculously thick pad of character sheets and a punch board filled with cardboard kitty treat tokens. 
Now, while the deluxe wooden tokens and dice with cat paws on them would have been nice, there's nothing actually wrong with the dice that are here or the punch boards or the, like they work. There's nothing wrong with them. You don't need wooden kitty tokens. The cardboard will suffice. As well, you do get the deluxe flocked insert. So oh, if you geez. do upgrade, your components are all well cared for in the box. But it also reminds you that you didn't get all those cool components like the decks of cards mm -hmm. that the insert would lovingly cradle if they were there. Yeah, that, that is definitely an issue. And I will be bringing that up in my final thoughts as well. Um, but before I move on, I do want to talk a bit about the rules um, just because they're striking. Uh, this is, first of all, a full on traditional RPG with lots of text. Like this is not a quick read. This is not an eight page rule book. Uh, the text is presented in a two column layout, with lots of white space. It's expertly designed like honestly as i was opened it up and was reading it for the first time i was like sharing pictures with sean and deanna like look at this book like it's just really striking layout um there's great looking artwork there's a ton of call outs tips and examples and what i really liked was the amount of game advice that was how to play and like how you should do things and why you should do things and not just mechanics not just how to play but like how to play well how to how to manage a group how to all, mo very modern things that were missing from our original role-playing games now what i'd like to do next is a fairly detailed look at the three books you get in the box then after that i'll share my thoughts on the game based on both reading it and running it this is not just a read review we have gotten this one to the table so let's start off with the biggest book the rule book so the rule book for Magical City Save the Day is a soft cover, full color book with a total of 65 pages. Again, not a quick read. The book doesn't use chapters. Instead, it's broken into a number of sections which are presented in a pretty logical order. Well, this isn't great for reference during play, having to flip and try to figure out where things are. There is an index on the back cover of the book. So this is a big book. Uh, it's box sized and soft, so not the easiest to hold yeah. and read, despite the fantastic layout. Yeah, I do agree. It's 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 a strange. I'm going to say about ten by ten is probably about the size of the book, which is not a standard format, right? It's not a a big normal RPG rule book, nor is it a, a digest size. Now, this book starts by talking about what the game is about and what role playing is. Um, one of the main things you're going to find throughout all of the books, um, sorry, two of the books, the, in the, the core rules and the City Source book, are kitty tip callouts. These do a great job at explaining why the rules are the way they are, offering additional options, and providing great role playing tips and even RPG theory talk. Like there's a lot of what I would call modern role playing advice included here, talking about things like when not to roll the dice and encouraging you to not roll the dice and just let the players do what they want to do. A discussion on player knowledge versus character knowledge and bringing that into play in metagaming when you do need to roll the dice and all kinds of things that involve player input, including the actual resolution mechanic itself. There's even a whole discussion on can you win a role playing game? which is just great to see lots of these modern ideas. So while excellent, excellent to read about and see in a book, in a, in a RPG book, this is going to be advanced for some younger GMs, despite what seems like a game designed with kids in mind. What I do like though, is if this was your first role-playing game, you're getting that stuff up front. These are the kind of things that have taken us 20, 30 years to learn in role playing. And here it is presented as if it's normal because it is nowadays. And I think that's actually fantastic. Next, we learn how to be a magical kitty, which sets the tone and expectations for all the players. This is an important thing that many role playing games skip. This is what you're meant to do in this game. You are playing magical kitties. You must keep your magic hidden from the humans. You want to help your human. Nope, that's important. It's like starting a D&D game going, no, you're not evil. You are heroes. You want to be heroes. You want to help your human. That is your goal. That's what we're here to do. You can understand your human, but they can't understand you. And you have like a special spot in your house that humans don't know about that'll let you come and go from your house without being noticed. And it reiterates, you must keep your magic hidden from the humans. So that's an important part of the game. There are a couple more of these kitty rules, but they all kind of follow that same format. Now, before the book gets into any retail, real details of how to play, it tells you to stop right there. Now you know what the game's about. Now you know some overall principles. Go play The Big Adventure. This is a digest-sized comic book that's included, but I'll get back to that after I finish talking about the rule book. 
it is, we should though note though, a much more manageable <laughs> book to hold and read. Yeah, it's it's that standard digest size, right? It's nice. So the Magical Kitty rule book next goes into an example play, and this is honestly the best example play I have seen in any rule book I've ever read. And I have led a lot of RPG rule books. Because not only it does it walk you through your typical short encounter with fictional players and a fictional DM with little brackets for their character name and their real name, like I've seen that a hundred times. What this does is as each section of the story unfolds, they use those kitty tips where it explains the rules that were being used, why the GM used that particular rule, and how the rule worked. So this like goes for, look, the DM didn't call for a role at this point, and here's why. Oh, the DM did call for a role here, and why? Oh, here, the kitties are going to have to make checks. Here's how they work. And then here, the DM's going to look for success, and because the success was this, this is what happened. That was amazing. Like, that was fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, this part is clearly designed to help players and GMs not mm -hmm. only get more comfortable with the rules, which is really the point of any of these sort of mm -hmm. adventures, but also asking questions and clarifying mm -hmm. things. It's one of those things that as as players, uh, when we were growing up, was never something you did, right? Oh. You, you didn't, no one ever encouraged asking questions or or trying to figure out why something was done that way. Mm -hmm. If the DM did something, it was because the DM did it. Next, we move on to character creation. It's simple. Pick a name for your kitty. You're going to pick a hometown. Uh, hometown's your setting, right? This could be the included setting in the book, which is River City, or something your group makes up on your own. Uh, note, the deluxe box set does come with more settings, which are available for sale separately. Uh, there's three of them, Wild Ones, Mars Colony, and Alien Invasion. And now there's a fourth setting that's being included in the current Kickstarter. Now, players are free to describe their kitties how they want and are encouraged to draw a picture of their kitty. There are some stats to be noted down, like your owie limit, your level, and your number of starting kitty treats. Plus, you're going to pick three numbers for your primary attributes. These are where you're going to come up and play all the time. The attributes in this game are cute, cunning, and fierce. One of these starts at three, another at two, and the last one at one. Nothing really unfamiliar to players of most modern RPG games. It's just they've picked cute names for their stats instead yep. of whatever your other game theory might be. And while people may find three stats limiting, you know what it works. Cute is when you're trying to convince people to do things. Cunning is when you're trying to figure things out. And fierce is for physical activity. That pretty all, much covers everything. Yep, all you need. Next, you're going to determine your talent, your flaw, and what magical power you have. Now, this is done by either picking off an included list, each of which has 36 entries, which is impressive, or rolling randomly on those lists, or sitting down with your DM and group and making your own. Now, if you own the kitty cards, you could also do this through card draws. Now, what I want to do is just highlight some of them just to give you an idea what this is about. I do go into more detail in the written review, but some talents are night vision, claws, empathic, bargainer, and hunting. Flaws include things like gluttonous, loud, show-off, and careless. And magical powers can be things like flight, laser eyes, burrowing, or time freeze. Now, the last step in character creation is to pick your human. This is another thing of the game, is the kitties always pick the humans, despite what the humans might think. Most details here are left up to you, uh, except for the people's problem. Remember, every human has a problem. Well, it ends up, it's actually many of the people have many problems, more than one. What you're going to do is you are going to determine your problems and assign them ranks and every human will have four ranks and problems so this could be one big problem at rank four or four small problems at rank one or anything in between now that number besides giving an indication of how big the problem is mechanically it's also the number of adventures you'd need to go on to solve that problem now, there are a couple short random charts for determining what types of problems these are but the details are really up to you to flesh out Right, and this is a great way to help craft and shape the adventures mm -hmm. to follow right there within your character creation, which is again yes. another one of these these strong modern gaming mm. uh, ideas where the character creation helps form what comes later. Yeah, literally what you're doing here without them calling that is you are doing shared world building right during character creation. It's not called out the way some games do it, but I think that's good. Again, they're trying to normalize things like that, and I think that's fantastic. Next, we get to actually playing the game. So this is a game that uses a D6 dice pool system. You start by gathering a number of D6s equal to your stat. 
Again, cute's game for, for getting people to do what they want. Cunning's for figuring things out and fierce is for fighting. So whichever one applies, you're going to grab one, two or three D6s. You can then grab a bonus die if your talent applies. Now, again, it's got to narratively apply. You can't just say find some forced way for your talent to apply. And you get two more D6s if you can work your magical power into it. You can lose dice as well from the pool, but only for injuries. So if your kitty's been injured, not just an owie, but actually injured, you'll lose a die from the die pool. The DM then is going to assign a difficulty um, from three to six, easy to extreme. You then roll the die. Each die that meets or beats this difficulty is a success. So on an easy, you have more than a 50% chance per die to succeed. Now, success is a scaled, it, it, it's a, a, there's, there's multiple types of success. It's not a win, lose, yes, no, which I like. This is something else inspired by modern games. I'm, I'm personally reminded of Powered by the Apocalypse style games with the success system, though it's not six or under or whatever, but just the, the types of successes you get. So if you rolled zero, you didn't roll higher on any of the dice, you failed. You don't do what you wanted, and there's a complication. One is success, but. You do what you wanted to do, but there's a complication. Two is your, your standard. You succeeded. You did what you wanted. No, you need two successes to get the, you got off scot-free. You did exactly what you wanted. Now, if you manage to roll three successes, you get success and. You do what you wanted and you get a bonus. Then finally, there's four successes. That's considered a super success. You get to do what you wanted and get a super bonus. Right. And again, we're in familiar territory here. This is very much uh, a, a sort of, you know, generic dice pool, modern dice pool thing. Not quite as simple as, you know, rolling 2d6 and 7 plus and 10 plus on a PBTA, but it's still got that same sort of improv uh, where, you know, it's no and, yes and, Yes, and yes, but no, but yeah. and all that, you know, all these different different levels of success that allow you to play really easily in uh, off of what the role was. Yeah. So these complications, I said you get a complication, you actually get a list like there's a list of suggested ones. Again, it reminds me of make a move right in, in, in the power by apocalypse, make a GM move. Right. It's the same idea. Sorry, MC move. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to look at this list and pick something. So. It could be the thing uses a reaction. So if you're fighting something or you're up against an obstacle, it, they have a list of reactions. So their reaction could happen. You just suffer an owie and owies are kind of like the damage system, right? You could get put into a sticky situation. So you fail and it didn't work and something has, has bogged you down. It could be the inability to act for a period of time. You're knocked down, you get knocked far away, you have to get back, who knows? You could just lose a die from your next die pool. We found that one came up pretty often. Like right? it was just, you know what? You're, you're frustrated. So next time you go to do something, uh, another one I liked is you must do your flaw. So if it applies, the complication could be you're a coward. You have to run away from the fight. I keep saying fight. You know what? The game is really not about fighting. You have to run away from the encounter. You have to run away from the problem. Or if you're a chatterbox, you just don't shut up and you frustrate the person you're talking to. Um, a disaster is created. Disasters, I'll get into more because they're a mechanical thing, but that can be a complication. And the players and GM are encouraged to work together. This is not the GM's job to come up with complications. So if you're rolling for your kitty and you're trying to do something and you fail and you're like, oh, no, what it be would fit really well is if I fail this way, that's totally encouraged in this game. Yeah. And so, again, GM hard moves are yeah. the, the PBTA equivalent. Uh, this is so common. And again, you know, my masks game, I love it when players are like, OK, I've got this awesome thing I want to do. And I rolled a two and all. Oh, this would be so awesome if, and I'm like, okay, well, yeah. let's, let's roll with, I'm going to go that, but we're going to twist it a little bit this way because of something I know, you know, that sort of thing, yeah. you know, and it's great to have that back and forth relationship and mm -hmm. not the DM antagonistic relationship. Exactly. Now, bonuses are the same deal, right? They're codified. Now, these are generally picked by the player and actually literally, except for the one that says make up your own awesome thing that says needs GM approval. The others don't. So the players have full agency here. 
Now, the GM does get input, and again, you should have that back and forth, but this gives a lot of power to the players. Now, these include things like a fellow kitty gets a bonus on their next die roll, so you, you set them up for success. Or you can, you or a fellow kitty shrug off an owie, right? Like, you, you took a small bruise earlier, but now you're so involved with chasing the squirrel that you completely forget about that, and you, you, you've, you've shrugged it off. Or you accomplish a secondary goal. You were trying to catch the squirrel. Not only do you catch the squirrel, you actually happen to tumble and land right near the nuts he was trying to find that you were going to grab him to help with anyway. Or the foe can't cause trouble. This is a great one for trying to incapacitate, say, a bad guy. You, you distract the witch so that you can sneak out the back door with your human. Yeah, and this is, it's inter actually interesting, I find, that this, the GM has input here because in, in a lot of the PBTA games, this is where the GM doesn't, actually get much input uh and also often doesn't want the input uh oh, yeah. this is this is that you know the player has succeeded let the player take the take yeah. the mic run with it and 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 do their be their best character yeah it just it's trying to open up that two-way street right it, it, the, the whole game should be a group conversation which is not a term from this game but that that is a modern role-playing term mm -hmm. now there are also super bonuses uh, these are the same, right? The, these these are, are, you get them, you roll really well, and the player's going to get to pick. Now this, like, all kitties get a bonus, or everyone can shrug off an hour, or you can shrug off an injury, or if you're actually fighting or, or trying to distract someone or whatever, they take an extra owie to them. So it's like your critical hit. Now, I've also mentioned kitty treats. Um, these are in-game resource, another modern idea that players can earn and spend to do things like re-roll any die roll in the check or any or all dice roll, avoid taking injuries, uh, use a magic powers bonus feature, which is something I'm not going to get into detail of, but it's a way to do neat things with your powers. Or importantly, add something to the story that it would be beyond your kitty's control. This is another very modern thing where you are giving players narrative control over the universe where they can, yes, there is definitely a chandelier from the ceiling that you can swing off of to get from balcony to balcony or things like that. Now you earn kitty treats by bringing your flaw into play. Now, this is important. The flaw has to cause some kind of meaningful consequence to the story. Like being gluttonous and saying, yes, I'm always eating something. Or we go into the candy store and I steal a treat. Unless that candy store owner is going to react it doesn't matter whereas if your gluttonous kitty decides to eat the entire turkey dinner of your human just finished making moments before the mayor knocks on the door now that deserves a kitty treat yeah and so these uh, fate points bennies team points whatever meta currency your particular game might have as an equivalent mm -hmm. uh this is pretty much universal going back way into the history of the of role playing yep now, owies and injuries are the health system. Your kitty can take a number of owies before they get really hurt and start taking injuries. If you ever end up with as many injuries as your highest attribute, you're knocked out, and you're going to miss the rest of the current scene. But at the end of each scene, this isn't session, scene, all kitties remove one injury, and every kit kitty starts at full health at the start of each episode. Now, no, there is no way for a kitty to die in this game. And honestly, for the most part, death is off the table for Magical Kitty Save the Day, unless it's a story element, right? If you want to do a story about your humans grieving because someone died, that's completely different. But as far as a result of actions taken in the game, nothing's going to cause death. Enemies can get knocked out. They can give up and run away. They can snub for enough owies to beat them and get them to surrender. No death. And again, this is generally what happens in modern games. We don't want players to leave the adventure and we don't want uh emotional trauma if you're you're killing off uh killing off people period yeah either way on either side now magical kitty save the day does have a full very traditional experience point system where you're going to get a number of points and at the end of the game you're going to get points now one of the things they did toss in is a very pbta style rule which is every time you fail a check you get an experience point which is a rule i completely forgot when i was running the game so i owe my players a whole bunch of xp and then at the end of the game you're going to go through a list and you actually ask the table this did you save the day and if everyone thinks they saved the day you get xp did everyone have fun? No, everyone. This is important. If one of the players didn't have fun, no one at the table gets that experience, which I think is a great carrot to encourage everyone to work together and make sure everyone has fun. Did you learn a valuable lesson? 
I'll note that the adventures didn't seem to be written like um, after school stories. Like they didn't seem to be ham handed about this. So I think this is something that's going to be very dependent on your players. Did you learn a valuable lesson? Well, yeah, actually we learned this and be like, Oh, cool. It's, it's not forced. Like you'd expect from like a Saturday morning cartoon type show. Now kitties level up when they hit XP amounts. It's very like D and D where like, you know, your first level takes five, your second level is going to take six XP. The next one actually takes six, then it takes seven and so on. You spend the XP, like it goes away, you wipe it, and then start working to the next one. When you do that, you're just going to pick an upgrade. These are right on the character sheets, which is great, and they're broken into tiers. So level 2 to 4, 5 to 7, 9 to 10. Each time you get to pick one, though, you can actually pick one from your current tier. So if you're level 7, you can take it from the 5 to 7, but you can also go back to a previous tier, so you can take something from 2 to 4. These include things like getting a bonus feature, so it's some new way to use your, your magical ability. Um... Improving an attribute by one, so now your dice pools get a little bigger. Getting an additional kitty treat at the start of every session. Upgrading your owie limit so you can take more owies. Gaining new talents, and even at the higher levels, gaining completely new magical abilities. So it, it's interesting. It's a little bit of a meld of older and newer advanced systems mm -hmm. put together, but it does sound like an interesting one. Now, the second half of the rulebook includes information mainly for the Game Master, which they do use the term Game Master, because I know some games don't. Um, there is some great GM advice here with, again, lots of modern sensibilities. When to roll, how to set difficulties. One of the ones I love is what to do when a player tries something silly. This is the, my cat jumps off the roof because all cats land on their foot and how to deal with that, which I'm not going to get into how it describes it. You can discover that on your own. Um, trying actions that obviously won't work. Describing what happens. Another good one, making mistakes and dealing with them. What do you do when you make a mistake as a DM? Uh, various story structures and more. Now, there are details here about how to make a hometown, as well as how to use the published hometowns. Now, hometowns, which they didn't mention until this point, and I didn't realize until I got to this section of the book, also have problems, which is actually kind of cool. It makes sense. Now, at the start of your series, you are going to pick four ranks of hometown problems, just like you pick human problems. This is followed by a lot of talk on how to handle problems, including how you should start each episode, each session by choosing a hometown problem and aiming it at one of the kitty's human problems. And then there's talks about taking your various problems and making alliances between them. And then things for when problems no longer are problems anymore. And this really reminds me of the front system from PBTA renamed and told in a different way. And I gotta say this part of the book, made me start to really feel like this is not actually a kid's game. It is a game you can play with kids, but like, like the rules for creating and playing kitties are simple, easy to grasp. I, I would say you could probably easily play with a, like a five or six year old, possibly even younger. As long as they can count the numbers on the pips and compare them to a number you said, you're good to go. You probably play with a younger kid if you roll dice for them. But once you get to this DM section here, this is some pretty high level stuff. Like these are not the kind of things I'm used to seeing in a gateway role-playing game. And I could see a beginner GM being completely confused and overwhelmed by what's here. Now, early in the book, it does suggest that an adult older sibling or babysitter be the GM when playing with kids. But it wasn't until I actually got to this section that I saw why they thought an adult should be running it. Yeah, and again, so this is great for first-time players, and we, we know that, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it later, but your family did have fun playing this. Yes. But this is not something to take lightly as a GM. This is not necessarily uh, something you want to enter into lightly. So even if it is going to be your first game, and it, and it may well be, you want to really take your time yeah. and, and prepare carefully for it. Yeah, and I would still say, like, there is some DM advice here I wish I had learned in my first game. Like, there is some great stuff here. But just that the, the fronts and problems and how they, sorry, the, the problems and how they <laughs> interact just was a step above. So once you've hopefully figured out this problem system, the game then gets into creating adventures. And this is a really, again, high level, more than you'd expect from what seems like a simple game. But it gives you a number of really solid, what they call adventure recipes that are basically what I would call story beats, or if I'm talking Robin Laws, right? Different things you want to hit during your session. It doesn't use that terminology. That's my terminology or Robin's terminology. And these include uh, a number of different ones, like the boss rush, the five scenes, a simple mystery, the raid, and the rescue operation. Each of these basically give you a formula that you fill with problems, foes, challenges, role-playing elements, and more. 
So for example, the five scene recipe, you're going to start off with the first threat, then it's going to move to the puzzle, then the role playing, then the trick or double cross, and then you get to the big finale. And we won't get into a discussion uh, <laughs> of whether or not to include puzzles in RPGs this episode. I would like to refer to gaming and BS for some great episodes on that topic. <laughs> yeah, the puzzle here may not be a solve a physical puzzle. And to be honest, the way the game is written, you are going to use cunning for most things. Like you're 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 not going to necessarily rely on player knowledge. You're going to that's why those player stats are there. There's the I'm going to try to solve the puzzle, and because I'm in too inquisitive, I actually have already previously researched this back at the library, so I get my bonus. It's more of that kind of thing than actually handing the group a puzzle to solve. Though that could be a great learning moment if you are trying to add some uh, teaching moments to your games. Now, the final section of the book gives you details of the foes and disasters that you can slot into these recipes. Now, it even notes these recipes are great once you learn them for improv -ing. Personally, I found that structure approach a little odd, but again, I'm coming from a very traditional uh, Marvel superheroes to Shadow or to Cyberpunk to Warhammer with a bit of D and D mixed in their background. So it's just not the way I think of DM adventures. But they're saying like once you learn these, you can just throw them up. Like, oh, the players want to go over here, no problem. That sounds like it's going to be a raid, which is you're trying to raid a building and get in to get a thing. So what this is is all the stuff you need to fill in those gaps. So you have foes; they have their own sets of stats. But then they're done used differently, right? This is this is another one of those games. And no Powered by Apocalypse didn't do it first, started with uh the fate system from TSR. Is the DM doesn't roll any dice. They they do not interact with the randomizers, it's all on the players. So what these stats actually are are the target numbers the kitties roll against when facing the foe. So if a witch has a four cunning, that means trying to use cunning on the witch needs a four. Now, foes have owie limits, no injuries though. If you hit the foe's owie limit, they're defeated in some appropriate way now the neat bit here and i've seen this in dungeon world i don't know what other games it might be from is the foes have reactions these are what that foe does when you need a complication so these are tools the dm can use when the players fail to check so if you're looking for a complication you can look and all foes have three of them there are all kinds of different foes um presented from the mundane other kitties, various humans, squirrels, and guard dogs, to the fantastic, which is hyper-intelligent raccoons and aliens. I, I want to know what hyper-intelligent raccoons aren't mundane. They need to see <laughs> the ones around my neighborhood. Uh, and, and hard <laughs> moves are what uh, I would call that for, as a masks player. Uh, okay. So every every villain I, I, I develop or that you find in a book has got a certain number of hard moves that are the, the, actions, that, are the actions that they perform okay. when a role gets missed. Yeah, so there you go. Same same type. Of, I knew it was a, a modern RPG thing, but I love having that as a DM, being able to focus on the game and not worry about dice and just having this quick list of, okay, you failed. What happens? And I look and I'm like, oh, you're fighting a, uh, a magical book. Well, it could cause paper cuts or it could just close up and pretend it's a normal book or it could fly away. And if you don't catch it and I'm like, oh, that's so I want to have that happen. Or I could go to the whole list as the other ones normally. Now, disasters represent natural or supernatural events. These actually usually come into play through a consequence. So somewhere where someone gets a failure or a partial success, you can bring a, a disaster in. So you're sitting there trying to run away from the witch and you fail, you might knock over a candle and start a disaster like a fire. Now, each disaster features a number of reactions. These are neat because these can be used for consequences for anything during the scene, not just when dealing with the fire, right? The room's on fire. Yes, you're trying to put out the fire. You're going to use the fire reactions. But if you're still trying to escape from the witch and ignoring the fire, you still could get burned. I thought that was a really smart way to use this system. Like an example is the earthquake has the reactions, debris, everyone takes an owie in the room or in the area, crumbling walls and exit is closed off, or blackout the causes power to fail in the area and you're stuck in a black room. Now, the last couple pages of the rule book, I know this is a long one, big book, as we said, though not nothing compared to the, some 300, 900 page tomes. But for again, for an intro game, this is a significant book. Uh, you get a glossary of words. Why is this in the back of the book? Like, like I, I read my books from cover to cover 
there's stuff here I would have liked to have known before. But anyway, minor complaint. And then there's a GM worksheet in the back. You can photocopy, which does anyone photocopy? You can also download it from atlas.games or atlasgames.com. Uh, this is to keep track of the kitties and the problems. And I got to say, this thing wasn't very useful, but more about that when I get to my final thoughts. So the GM worksheet sounds like the same sort of thing that I've seen in the back of every PBTA game I've ever uh, seen. <laughs> and I've never used one myself, there but go. they're always there. So that was just the rule book. Yeah. There's still two more books to get through. How about you tell us about the comic book? All right, again, uh, bear with me, right? Because th that rule book is the biggest me in the box. Uh, it's the book with the most pages and the most stuff to learn and talk about. So these other two are not going to take nearly as long to cover. So the next one is the comic book. It's it's a digest-sized, full-color comic book, only 34 pages long. And as I mentioned earlier, right near the start of the rule book, it's going to direct you to stop reading and go play this. And it makes perfect sense. It's, a, it's an adventure. Uh, it's presented in a choose-your-own-adventure style format that has you flipping all over the book. And I got to say, flipping and flipping and flipping. Uh, there's a lot of flipping needed to get to the end of the story. Uh, it tells the story of a single kitty looking for the human's favorite toy that's gone missing and has been lost. Early clues lead them to check out a mansion that's rumored to be haunted. Now, the book does a great job of slowly teaching you the basics of how to play Magical Kitty Save the Day, uh, walking you through making a sample character using, uh, like, there's only three powers to choose from, and there's only eight talents and eight flaws, but it gives you the basics. Um, it also gets into the basics of rolling the dice without getting into the details of complications and bonuses. The story features lots of different paths and really shows off how you can use your kitty powers in a variety of ways and presents multiple options for dealing with the obstacles. And I got to say, anyone who's going to play Magical Kitties, play through this book. Like, don't just skip it. It's, it's worth going through. All right. Well, that just leaves the hometown setting source book, River City. All right. This is another soft cover book, but this is the same size as the rule book, right? That 10 by 10. Uh, this is only 35 pages long. Now, River City is very much small town USA. Uh, featuring the things you'd expect in small town USA. And this is very much USA. As a Canadian, there's definitely stuff there that I haven't seen, but every, you know, after school special Hallmark TV show or uh, WandaVision has shown me just what small town USA should look like. That's what you got here. You've got a busy waterway that the town was built on, a beautiful town square where people like to gather with a statue in the middle and shops all around, a single big Carnegie style library, and of course, a huge chemical plant that everyone kind of hates but tolerates because it's the biggest employer in the city. There's even a local game store in the town square. Now, along with this, though, are some fantastic elements, like the fact Baba Yaga has just moved into town. The Queen of the Frost Giants is staying at the hotel, and there's an old castle up on the hill that's been there as long as anyone can remember, plus a house in the suburbs that changes color every day. Now, along with the book, you do get a poster-sized map of River City that features all these interesting locations with a like a zoom in on the town square. And for those of you not watching, the map is a nice, clear, really good quality map uh, of mm -hmm. large size for a table. Now, a very large number of River City problems are next presented in the book. And as mentioned earlier, your hometown only has four ranks of problems at a time. As you solve problems, yes, you're meant to add new ones to keep the game going, right? Otherwise, your campaign's going to end. But I was shocked to find nine different fully detailed problems presented in this book of ranks from one to four, including multiple fours. Now, these problems include uh, the aforementioned Baba Yaga, uh, problems at the chemical plant, obviously, uh, the toy maker, the mice resistance, neighborhood burglars, and more. Now, each problem is described in detail, which is broken out by a problem's agenda, what it's trying to happen, like what the, the mice resistant are trying to accomplish, and a set of adventure ingredients that are basically prompts for ways to tie each of these problems into their own ongoing story. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the actual way you're supposed to design an adventure is to pick one of these and aim it at your human. So you have the mice resistance trying to do a thing. Well, how can I involve one of the cat's humans in what the mice resistance is doing to get the players involved? That's that whole aim a problem at a problem thing that might be hard to grasp. And they, they certainly help out the GM while at the same time not making it easy mm. for the GM to handle all these various complexities that need to be managed in a, a uh, system yeah. of this level of complexity. But now remember, though, you're only going to have four ranks of problems. 
So for a first GM, pick one that's ranked four. Then you only have one thing you have to focus on. So it's weird. Like I said, they present way more than I thought. I thought there would be, here's four ranks of problems that are happening in River City. Go. No, here's nine all over the place. Now, after problem, you get into details about locations. Um, Some locations I haven't mentioned yet are the Clock Tower, Danbury's Antique Shop, the Mermaid Fountain, the Montgomery Hotel, Hawthorne Beach, the Cliff Size Hospital, Dewberry Park, and more. Um, each of these, again, uh, in, they're broken up into neighborhoods, and each neighborhood will have more adventure ingredients, so ways to tie those places into your adventures. Then we get the supporting cast. This is filled with a number of important River City characters. Um, note, these aren't all humans, but the human cast members, instead of having adventure hooks, have listed their human problems, and a total of four ranks. So I thought this was cool, because what this lets you do is you can use these as your kitties' humans. So you have pre-built humans that you could use that will tie into this existing setting. And there's even a random chart so you can roll it up to see randomly which of your kitties humans is one of these important people in River City. And with my group, one of the three players did end up going with a random uh, NPC off this list. It's always nice to be able to hook your characters into the world, the pre-built world, directly Mm -hmm. like this as just that that one extra step, less step for the GM Mm -hmm. to have to worry about building from scratch. The other thing I like, too, is it also gives you an option for younger players where they don't have to come up with a human because that is a pure whatever you want, what your human want. Like if you're not comfortable with improv and telling stories, though, honestly, the younger kids are usually better at that than some of us <laughs> older kids. So after the cast, we get foes. Uh, these are adversaries for you to face. This has a number of new foes that aren't in the main rule book. Uh, there's fey folk, a number of dinosaurs. Why do you need dinosaurs in small town USA? Uh, scrap pixies and the Mulgrim. You've got five new River City specific disasters that are presented, which include a blizzard, magical mist, and whitewater rapids. So certainly no shortage of content to play with even with just the one book you get in the basic box set. Now, this book does finish off with an adventure. Um, It is Magical Kitties Save the Library. This is a 13-page adventure split over four scenes. Uh, The scenes are in a logical order, but can actually happen. Like, scene one has to happen, but after that, it can go in any order. Uh, This is designed first off as a way to get your kitty crew together because it has a number of humans going missing. So if your group's brand new and you don't want to come up with a backstory of why are you working together? Here you go. Here's your, your, there no beating in a tavern here, but here's your way to get the group together. All your humans are gone missing. You're all going to investigate the library together. Now the format of this adventure is kind of strange. It, it's just not what you expect. Like it, it, it's kind of old school mixed with new school. So you got the location descriptions. You got talk all about foes and their agendas and what's going to happen if the kitties don't interfere. But then you've got like old school callbacks, like box tests to read, but not enough to give a full description. Like it, it's it's strange. The thing I found even more strange is there are no gameplay mechanics or stats or what to roll or difficulty levels listed in this adventure. Sorry, there's a couple difficulty levels for like two things. But in general, the mechanics have been stripped out. Um, There were also a number of things that instead of giving you details on just said check page this and River City book and even some other stuff that's like check the main rule book. Now, I get it. I, I think I, I don't know if they had a hard 35 page limit here or what. The fact the last page of the adventure is literally on the back inside cover might indicate that. But like I get not wanting to repeat information in more than one spot. But this would be so much more usable, especially for a new GM, if everything was just there. Like, come on, d and has been putting mon- smaller monster stats in their adventure blocks since 1970-something. Like, I, I find it really weird that the stuff you need to run the adventure isn't in the adventure. So due to this, I have a feeling not many GMs, new or old, are going to be able to run this on the spot. Like, just pick it up. We've all read it. We've made our kitties. Let's play. And you've never read the adventure before. Ooh, that's going to be a mess. Like, unless your players are willing to put up with a lot of flipping through three, well, two different books during the game, you're probably going to need to do some prep work. And this is just an odd callback to older style games where read through prep was absolutely expected Mm -hmm. of the GM with any new adventure you were going to be playing. Uh, Yet otherwise, it's such a modern storytelling game that it's it's a strange uh, balance to see. I, I thought it was very strange. 
Now, the story itself is very entertaining. Uh, it's very enjoyable. It's very whimsical. I think it's probably the best word I could use to describe it. It does a great job of showing off the mixing of the mundane and the magical, which is, of course, a big theme in Magical Kitties you probably picked up. Um, the other thing that Deanna pointed out to me is there are a lot of things the kids won't get and the adults will in this particular adventure, which I think is great to see. Uh, there, But there are a ton of NPCs to track in this. I, I should have brought my notes up here so I could hold up my, my list of just one specific type of NPC. I think there's nine of them. And these are NPCs with their own motivations and their own personality types and the way they talk. And I found, I literally had to make a list of notes before playing to be able to keep track of who's who and their personalities and where you find them. And even doing this, I still was flipping through the books we played because there were things I just forgot to note down or stuff I thought would have been in the adventure that weren't. One of the things I will note is there are NPCs that insist they are always called by their full name. Well, the full names are in a different section than their stat block. So maybe you should have used that GM reference sheet. <laughs> I uh, know not for this. The GM reference sheet is for managing your overall town problems and your humans, not for a specific adventure. So it, it's more of an over overall sheet that again, we'll get back to. Uh, now, while my family did enjoy the adventure, um, to be honest, we haven't quite finished it yet because it took a very long time to play through. Now, I, I don't remember where I got this in the rule book. Somewhere in there, it notes that a usual session of Magical Kitties would be an hour or two, which makes sense for a, a kid's game. After four hours of play, we only managed to get through three of four scenes in this included story. And that's not going to count like the hour of Deanna had to make a character and the kids wanted to play through the comic book thing. Um, like I almost wonder if they expected you to play one scene an evening to get that two hour time frame. But then if you did that, that wouldn't that doesn't fit with the XP system. Like it just doesn't work that way. Now it's also possible that my particular family spends way more than the usual amount of time describing their actions. Uh, my kids like to get very verbose and very detailed about exactly how they do a thing. And they do like interacting with the NPCs, especially Gigi really like to just hang out with the NPC she liked. I am really curious, and I haven't seen this in another review yet, is how long did this ta adventure take? So if you played Magical Kitties, I wanna know, how long did it take you to play through this library adventure? Fans of the show will note that your kids do love to embrace the world <laughs> of their games and embellish delightfully. Yeah. Now, so that's all the books. You've obviously read them all and actually run the game for your mm -hmm. family. What are your final thoughts on Magical <laughs> Keys Save the Day? All right. So when I first heard about this game, I just needed it. I had to get this. Like, like come on magical cats trying to solve humans problems without getting caught that just sounds awesome like i was the one that reached out to atlas this was one where i was like oh atlas games i saw your magical kitty kickstarter i didn't say i'm broke but i'm like hey i'd be really interested in reviewing this once production copies are out would, would that be cool that would be awesome and they're like i don't know here review breakdancing meeples and i'm like all right sure which would be a fun game check out my breakdancing meeples like, so we did a couple reviews for them and i think they're just trying to test the waters and make sure that we actually produce the content we said we're going to produce so eventually it shows up i didn't even know it was coming just boom hey i got this box set and i was all excited and unfortunately due to the fact the deluxe edition was doing so well and sold out in two weeks which is great for Atlas, it wasn't great for me because they sent me the standard edition. Now, I will say, despite only having the standard edition, I'm still really impressed by this game. It does a lot of things right. I think it's a fantastic game for playing with kids. And I think this theme, like we keep talking about this as a kid's game, kids this, kids that. This is not a game just for kids. I know plenty of adults that would have a fantastic time playing this game with no kids in sight. And I'm not even talking like beer and pretzel drinking game. I know adults that would love to play Magical Kitties. I think there is a, 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 a enough meat here to keep gamers of all experience levels interested. It isn't just a kid's game. It's just a youthful theme. And the mechanics are simple enough that kids could rock them. Now that said, I do want to point out a couple complaints. Um, these are specifically because I got the standard edition. Uh, 
And again, I'm not blaming Atlas. It sucks, but I get it, right? If they can sell them, why would they send out a review copy for a game they're sold out on? They don't need it reviewed. It's sold out, right? I get it. So the first thing I mentioned a bit above is the fact that both, I sorry, I didn't mention, I mentioned it in the full review, uh, or as you see in the unboxing, both versions of the game come with the same box insert. And this makes sense, right? For cost and production standpoint, I get it, but I couldn't help feel like my game was incomplete seeing that insert for the first time. Seeing four empty wells for holding cards just taught the fact I don't have cards right in my face. And then the lack of cards leads me to the next complaint. This one I think is more serious. The rule book, at least sections of it, were obviously written assuming you have the deluxe edition. There is a section near the start of the book when it's talking about making your kitty and drawing a picture of your kitty that says, great way to get inspiration for your kitties is to look through the cards, each of which features a different breed of cat. Then later in the same section, it says, hey, if you're playing with kids, one of the great ways to, to help them get into the game is to deal them out four of each of the magic power cards, talents, and flaws, so you limit their options so they're not looking at a huge list. Both of these are great suggestions. They make perfect sense, but only if you actually have the cards. So, which, as we noted earlier, are a $20 add-on. So to have the rules less than subtly suggest that you should have these cards is somewhat frustrating to say the least. Yeah, and if it had set, worded it, like a later in the book, it words it, if you happen to have the cards, here's a great way you can do this, I would have been perfectly fine. It was the, now just grab your deck of cards and do this. What deck of cards? Come on. That was frustrating. Now on a more positive note, uh, even without the dar deluxe upgrades, I basically said this at the top of the review, the components you do get are great. Quality is great. The writing's clear and concise. The artwork's fabulous. Everything you need to play is here. You've got character sheets, kitty tokens, dice, the adventure, the rules. Uh, all you really need to play this is some players and something to write with. Uh, sorry, Red Meeple Ryan, no included pencils in this particular copy. That would have been cool. Nice car. Oh, that would have been a deluxe upgrade anyway. Uh, rule books well written. Uh, it makes sense. It's in logical order. Um, the instruction, I, I, the system that read the first part of the book, go play the big adventure, then come back, worked really well. Like it's a great way to onboard the game. And we all really enjoyed playing through the comic book. It was fun. Everyone in the family did it. Some of us did it more than once to try out different powers. Yeah, no, the callouts in the books are also a really helpful mm. feature along the way. They really thought a lot about the process of people playing through the game and questions that mm -hmm. arise. Now, the rules, of course, Magical Key Save the Day are very simple. Um, they remind me of Mermaid Adventures. So if you check out my review of that kid's game on the blog or YouTube, you'll see how both games have a dice pool that you build the same way, right? You find there's three attributes. You find the attribute that's applicable. You take that many dice. If you've got an applicable skill, power, or talent, you take more dice and you roll them. Now, Magical City Saves the Day takes things a step further. In, in Mermaid Adventures, they opposed rolls, you're looking at just rolling over four or not. This is a little bit more common complex with a more modern system, especially with the degrees of success and including an in-game resource that can be spent with the, the kitty tokens that can be used to mitigate randomness and affect the story. So it, it's definitely a step above that, but the dice pool is very similar. And what I really dig are these modern touches. This is what I appreciate most about Magical Kitty Save the Day. Things like including the players when determining results of checks, uh, a very detailed complication and bonus mechanic that drives the story. It's made to drive the story forward. This is very much a fail forward. Complications do not mean bad things. And it's very clear on the fact that you always have a, don't roll if your complication is the story stops or you can't get through the door. The other thing, I would do though to improve on this is to include the bonus super bonus and complication list right on the character sheet because the character sheets are great and they have all the rules of the game they even have full rules somewhere on the back but they skip these charts which is weird because these charts are things the players pick off of so i was a little frustrated by that like when we played i actually told the player well flip over your sheet and do this and like there's nothing here and i'm like what why wouldn't they put that on the sheet that's the thing they're going to pick through the most often so definitely worth making, uh, probably making your own reference card mm -hmm. to have on the table and, and you'll pass around when someone's making a roll. Yeah, I agree. Something, something like that would be really useful. Now, one modern take in here that I'm not too sure about was that whole problem system, right? The, the, the whole DM is meant to use this structured system for adventure design. And again, it's, it's fronts from Apocalypse World or other clocks or other things from PDE, 
PBTA games that I'll admit I have a hard time wrapping my head around fronts. So I guess it makes sense that I'm having an issue with it here. The whole concept of picking a hometown problem, pointing it at a human problem, possibly having your problems align to make things more interesting. Like I just found this kind of confusing. And this is from someone who's run RPGs for over 30 years. I worry someone new to DMing a game for the first time is going to find this even more overwhelming than I am. Or maybe not. Maybe the problem is that I have been running games for 30 years and I'm old and stuck in my ways and I just think games should run in this logical pattern and they don't. So maybe this concept would be really easy to grasp if I didn't have a preconceived notion of how to create adventures. Well, I, I have to say from my point of view, I think it, I may actually be you. Uh, I fair. haven't found the concept too tricky, but... I was always a player and not a GM until recently with modern RPGs. So I came into it thinking about that overarching bad and how to link that into each player as I developed my masks game. And it came rather naturally to me personally. And, and then again, this may be me and, and it still could be difficult for other people, but as someone who didn't do the, go through the, the GM hoops that you have over the years, right. Uh, I didn't have that that change of uh, idea necessary. All right, speaking of GMing the game, we're finally going to get to it. So the one thing the game provides to help out that I found almost useless is the GM adventure reference in the back of the rule book. I don't know who made this. Like, like it almost feels like a joke because... I don't think anyone ever used this as it's written because it gives you more room to write a single digit for your stat than it does to fit in your kitty's human and their problems. It is literally a smaller box than one they give you to write a one digit number. Like, like no one, like I, I, I one point font wouldn't fit any of my players problems in that little box. Now I haven't seen this, but it sounds like it could be something who's that's been made by a graphic designer instead of a GM. I don't know. It, it honestly is one of the most useless things I've seen in a role-playing game, except for maybe inspiration to make your own. Now, as for actually using all this stuff at the game table and actually playing, my kids had a great time just making their kitties. Um, this is a game where they just want to keep making kitties. And I remember that, just spending time making characters. They loved looking over the River City map and looking for Easter eggs and small details. Like they caught that there's a game store with a D20 shaped sign in the town square and thought that was awesome. And well, the proof is in the pudding. If the kids are enjoying the game, the players are enjoying it. That's the biggest selling point yeah. right there. Yeah, I just started to start off our game with the, the included adventure, right? The one in the River City book. And I, again, it was a mixed bag, like not just reading it, its layout, like it is a, an interesting story, uh, but it's just not written in a way you can sit down and read it and run it from the book. Like instead of providing a step-by-step -step walkthrough, which is what I expect in a, in a beginner box. No, this doesn't say beginner box, but it's the only box there is. So to me, it's, a, it's, it's your intro to Magical Kitties. It throws you right in, like, like, here you go. Here's a full adventure. Go. It's And it just assumes you've already mastered and internalized all the rules, which is evident in the way the story is presented and the lack of any game mechanics listed in the adventure. Like To run this as well as I did, I had to take time to prep before the game. I had to write down stats. I had to note some probable paths I thought my players would take. I made a ton of NPC personality notes and more. Well, I don't mind a little prep now and then, it's just not something I expect from what seems like a very light game and from what amounts to your starter first adventure. And even with all this prep work, I was still flipping through the books. Yeah, th this is the shocking part of this game to me, because one of the main features of many modern RPGs is the lack of prep mm. needed by the GM due to the cooperative nature of the game. Uh, but I guess because they're at least allowing for that possibility of the, the younger, less experienced players, they're, they're backloading onto the GM some perhaps. Uh, perhaps like I said, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm just not used to it. Like you said, I, I was used to it. So this is one of the things where I, I have grown up and learned new ways to play. Like, this is not a sit down at the table and play to discover what happens. It is not that type of modern story game. This is a, you finish your adventure. You now, there's a whole math thing here where you adjust the problem levels. And then the DM before the next sitting is going to have to sit there, look at those newly adjusted problems, find one of the city problems, do that whole aim the problem at a human and come up with a story this isn't the kind of thing where 
you're just like possibly you might have some prompts for when the last story ended where the kitties might want to go next but like there's no just all right we're sitting down let's go like i i'm sure with enough experience you could get there but uh, just starting off no i don't think so like I, I honestly this is not the easiest game i've sat down to run for the first time like i think i did a good enough job as my family had a blast playing the game uh we found the system worked well like really well the dice pool system the degrees of success system um the complications and bonuses the narrative control the players had my kids loved that they loved having the, the additional power uh especially compared to playing traditional games like dungeons and dragons as a gm i loved the retaliation rules for the foes and 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 the disasters and i liked the the improv tools it gave me the ability to the, the, the complications weren't oh you take an alley it wasn't always oh you failed take an alley or oh you failed get minus one there, were, there was a wide range to choose from yeah no it's interesting i mean they've used so many great modern tools like hard move tables or hard move lists and things like that to allow you to mix it up and use this dice pool system mm -hmm. in a very modern way uh and then and then gone with a a not linear adventure but no definitely not actually but, but uh, you know, more, more, uh, again, you know, that, that front loaded adventure that's put weight on the DM. Yeah, it definitely puts weight on the DM. Uh, well, it's not an adversarial game. The DM's going to have to do the extra work. And plus, as I mentioned before, this, this simple adventure is not short. Like I, I was expecting a quick one shot, not a multiple session story that I'm going to have to return to days later uh, while we're enjoying it. And I don't mind breaking it up. It's just not what I expected. Reading the rules. I was expecting the short session. And to be honest, it kind of disrupted our plans. We're like, we're going to start playing at this time. And then we're going to have dinner and we're going to do this. And no, we started playing and just kept playing and kept playing and dinner was late and we didn't get done some stuff we were supposed to do, which was actually kind of fun to do. because we haven't done that that often where we, you know, waste time gaming. Now, I will admit there are some improvements I'd like to see. Um, for one, that GM Adventure Tracker give me something I can actually use. Um, put the resolution charts on the character sheets because you gave them everything else. Um, one of the big ones that players asked for is some way to mark if you have a plus one or minus one die pool. So again, one of the bonuses is get plus one on your next roll. And one of the uh, super bonus, everyone gets plus one. And one of the possible complications is minus one from your next roll. This is not a game where you're rolling dice constantly. Like it very much pushes the, let the players do what they want and it succeeds unless something interesting will happen if it doesn't. And well, so you don't roll, it's it's not like a combat in D&D &D where you're going to roll your D20 30 times. Like I, I didn't count how often we rolled dice, but what would happen was a extended period of time would happen between getting that bonus and being able to use it. And the characters, the players would forget they have it on both sides, like both to help them with pluses and minuses. I like, I, I'd like some way to track that even like writing on a character sheet, just not memorable enough. So either like, I don't know, I'm going to steal some plus one minus one tokens from magic gathering sets or something. But I saying that there's honestly nothing I would pull out of the game. There was nothing I thought didn't work again. I had a little eh, hard time kind of wrapping my head around the problems, but it works. Like it's, it's, it's their way of doing things different than the way I think that's a thing. Every game does things different. I wouldn't pull that out in any way. And to be honest, I find plus one forwards in masks really difficult to track myself. Yeah, that's see? that's a common issue I've run into as well. But the one thing to remember about this is make sure you're prepared. If you're going to be the GM for the game, it take the time and and really spend the time in advance. And as a result, it should be a fun time for all involved. So overall, there's a ton to love in Magical Kitty Save Today. This is a fantastic traditional RPG, not only great for new players and kids, at least on the player side, not necessarily the GM side, but it also features a number of modern RPG sensibilities that are integrated very well into the system and presented in a this is normal kind of way that I really appreciate. Now, if the concept of playing magical cats who work together to solve problems for their humans and helping out their neighborhood sounds fun to you, and how could it not, you should pick up this game. Well, I personally, 
only got to check out the standard edition. I will say if you can get it, I do strongly recommend spending the extra money for the deluxe edition. Besides getting some nicer components, you actually get three more full setting books, which I think also have adventures in them. You're getting three decks of cards. And some of these components are things that I actually think would help during play. For example, one of the cards is your magic power. Well, you're only allowed to use it once a scene. Well, it's really easy to flip that over. When we were playing last night, sometimes we, are we still in the same scene? Are we not? Did I use my power? Well, that's right. I used it so like it actually is going to enhance the gameplay put it this way i own the standard adventure uh it's right there behind me and i am still really strongly considering picking up the deluxe adventure just for those additional components so that's all we've got to say for magical kitties save the day for an even more detailed look at this family-friendly rpg box set be sure to check out the written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com